I don't know if you've noticed, but it kind of seems like the whole world is struggling with this pretty serious mental health crisis. And I think that that's connected to a crisis of faith and belief. I'm a youth pastor in Gainesville, Florida for Movement Youth. Thanks for checking out this channel. I believe that there's something for everybody here, whether you're looking to strengthen your faith or just explore your faith. Maybe you're part of our local Florida family here in the Gainesville area, or maybe you're one of our friends from another part of the world. We're glad that you're here. Either way, go ahead and hit that bell. Subscribe so that you get all the content we're putting out, like collective sermons, which are raw, honest messages from the Bible about issues that all of us deal with. Those are going to drop every Thursday morning. Then there's the For the Youth podcast where we're tackling topics that we haven't figured out how to address in church, but they're super important and we've got to talk about them. So we do them on a podcast. Then, of course, there's Movement Youth Music. They are racking up streams on streams on streams. And maybe you've heard their stuff on Spotify, but we're going to be putting stuff here as well because they're helping us to connect with our faith and worship God in a way that's really sincere and honest. And I think you're going to really enjoy what we're putting out. There's some other random stuff that we're going to sprinkle in here around this channel, like gaming, some long form live streams, whatever it is, it's going to be fun. So go ahead and hit subscribe. We want to help you grow in your faith. Go follow us on Instagram, go to the website, buy a t-shirt, sign up to come to summer camp with us, all of it. You're a part of the family now. We're glad you're here. Jesus, tonight we're talking about swimming pools, suffering, and superstitious Christians. Superstitious Christians. Uh, we're going to be, like they said earlier, we're in part four tonight of a series called For God So Love the Youth. And we're going to be in John chapter 5. Go to John chapter 5. I'm excited about this. I was telling our student serve team earlier, I talked to them a little bit ago. I said, you know, guys, I, uh, I've been enjoying going through the book of John with you guys. I've preached a, a few times uh, over the years. I've, I've got some reps and I've preached from a lot of different parts of the Bible. But whenever I come to the book of John, there are certain passages that I'm going to be on. If I'm honest, I kind of I kind of skip right to them. Somebody's like, hey, I need you to do something in John. I'll go, hey, John chapter 10. I love John 10. I know that passage. I've heard other people preach about it. I've preached about it. And, and that's a great passage of scripture where Jesus says, he, he says, hey, listen, I'm the door. I'm also the good shepherd. He says, uh, the, 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 the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but I am the good shepherd. And the good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. Put your hand up if you've heard that passage before. You've heard that passage, you're, you know that he's the good shepherd, right? Um, I love going straight for those familiar passages. Uh, they're really familiar. They're really encouraging to me. They've spoken in my life. But with this series, there were, there were a few other passages that we were drawn to that I've never preached from before. So it's been fun for me to learn more about God's word and hopefully help all of us learn more about God's word. And so we're in chapter 5. I've never preached from this passage before. Where were we last week? We're, we're in 15. I've never preached from John 15 uh, until last week. So this has been a whole lot of fun. I'm going to read um, the, the first like section of this. Then we're going to pause and we're going to talk about it. And then we're going to read a little bit more. And then we're going to keep talking about it. Y you get the idea. If you get it, say, I get it. Awesome, awesome. So John records seven supernatural miracles in his book, in the Gospel of John. And he, so he records Jesus walking on water. He records him feeding the 5,000. And uh, he records the miracle that we're going to look at today in John chapter 5 as well. This is one of those. Jesus was in Jerusalem, and he's there for one of these uh, Jewish religious festivals. It doesn't tell us which one. It might have been Passover. It might have been the Day of Atonement. It might have been um, uh, one festival or another. It's not so important which one, but he's there in Jerusalem, and he ends up in this place called the Pool of Bethsaida, where he heals a man who couldn't walk. Let's check this out. Look at verse 1 with me. He says, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. And there in Jerusalem, there's this sheep gate. And it's uh, over there by the sheep gate, a pool uh, in Aramaic called Bethsaida. And it has five roofed colonnades. So he says, this is, this is like a famous place. Like everybody knows where the sheep gate was. It's where the shepherds would bring in their sheep from the flock at night. And, and everybody is familiar with this. And he says, there used to be this place and there used to be this pool called Bethsaida. And then in verse three, it says, in these lay a multitude of invalids. I'm reading out of the ESV. You might be like, what is that? Well, it does explain. It says, well, these are people who are blind, who are lame, or maybe paralyzed. And these are people who are waiting there, waiting for the moving of the water. Because an angel would go down into the pool from time to time and stir up the water. And then after that, the first one who got in the water, after it was stirred up, recovered from whatever ailment they had. If that's interesting, say, ooh. That's kind of that's interesting. You don't read that every day. 
You don't hear that every day. Verse 5 says, one man was there who had been an invalid. He'd been paralyzed. He'd been uh, disabled in some way for 38 years. Somebody say, wow. 38 years is a very, very long time. Longer than most of us have been alive. And when Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he'd already been there a long time, he said, do you want to be healed? How about that for a question? If that was me and I'd been lame or I had been paralyzed for 38 years, I'd have said, yes! That's not exactly how he answers. He says, do you want to be healed? And the sick man answered him. He said, sir, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. And while I'm going down, another steps in before me. This is a really interesting passage of scripture. And in some ways, it's kind of vague. In some ways, I'm like, why do we not have more details? But I think we should... We should really look closely at the details that we do have and see what does this tell us about Jesus? What does this tell us about us, about mankind, about his creation, about his children? What, is it, what does it teach us about us? What does it teach us about God? What can we learn from this? So let's kind of like break a couple things down real quick. Um, how many of you guys are like, you're a good student. You're not trying to pat yourself on the back, but you're like, I, 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 do, I get pretty good grades by show of hands, by show of hands. How many of you guys are sitting next to a person who's like, crazy smart, but they're really humble or they're really shy. And yeah, yeah, go ahead and point them out. Be like, don't point at yourself. Be like, this one, this one's really smart over here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I went to school. Some of my best friends got like 1500s, 1600s on the SAT. They were just really, really smart. Um, they would get like, like a 36, 37 on the ACT. These guys were so smart. And I think I'm kind of average. Like, I'm like an average smart guy. I did get my education. I went to college, everybody. I did. Um, and uh, yeah, I know, I know. I got like the, the classic youth pastor degree where I had to take, listen to this. If you, if you got, how many math people do we have? You have any math people? How many of you guys hate math with a passion? Yeah, 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 that's me. That's me. I'm one of them. I am you. Listen, listen, hear me out. Hear me out. I went to a real college. I got a real degree. It's hanging in my wall. Hear me out. Hear me out. In four years of college, I took eight weeks of math. Eight weeks of math, everybody. Eight weeks. Come in. Uh, if you buy my course online, I'll teach you how. You, too, can get a four-year degree with just eight weeks of math. That was related to something. Nerds. I'm talking about nerds. Real quick. So... All you people who like math are nerds, if you get it. In verse 3 and 4, you might have an asterisk in your Bible, or you might not have a verse 3 and 4. Or maybe you have half of a verse 3 and none of a verse 4. Maybe you have both. Some of you guys are like, what? Someone's been tampering with my Bible. Well, yes and no. Listen. Some translations don't have verses 3 and 4. I'm reading out of the ESV, but I actually had to go and take verses 3 and 4 from another translation because the ESV doesn't have them in there. And the reason is because some of the earliest manuscripts for the book of John, for the Gospel of John that he wrote, some of the earliest manuscripts don't include verses 3 and 4. It's not that he said, I'm on verse 2 and I'm going to skip to verse 4. The, the numbers were added later. But those phrases, those words, weren't included in some of the oldest, like the earliest manuscripts. So it seems like John didn't actually write it but somebody who was making copies of his letter went back and added it later. It's like they were adding a footnote, uh, but they didn't maybe reference it very clearly. They didn't show their work. They didn't put it you know, in, the, in the footnotes or the end notes. And so um, it, it got a little bit confusing. People were like, why are you adding this? It seems like they're just trying to be helpful. Like, hey, John forgot to mention that people did this because there was this this, uh, this, this tale, or they would say that, you know, when you got in the water real fast, you would get healed, okay? And then there was an angel that went and stirred up the water, and that's how it happened. So whether or not you're like, I'm mad, I don't have verses 3 and 4, why do you have verses 3 and 4? That's not really the, the question. That's not too important. We would know some of this information anyway. Um, the question that we really need to be asking ourselves is, was it true? Was it true that there were some magical powers in this magical pool in Bethsaida, or the pool of Bethsaida over by the Sheep Gate in Jerusalem? Like, what, what do you guys think? You guys think it's real? Show, uh, by a round of applause. How many of you guys think, no, that was actually happening? That was a miracle that God was doing, and he was using an angel. How many of you guys think, no, 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 it's fake. Made up, made up. I don't believe it. How many of you guys, round of applause? Round of applause? I feel like a bunch of you guys are like, I just don't know. I just, 
I don't know. I don't think it's too important. But what it seems is that there were a lot of people who believed it. Whether it was true or whether it was like an old wives tale or, you know, something along those lines. Like, it seems like a lot of people believed it. So much so that somebody goes and adds it back into the Bible later. And it's good to know that, like, hey, these are the things that we can really, really trust. And these are the parts that are inspired by God. And maybe this is just like, this is some extra homework that was helpful for us as we were trying to figure this out. But really, that's the important question is, were the magical healing powers of this pool real? Or was it made up? Was God really sending an angel to stir up the waters and heal people? Maybe, or maybe it was a superstition. We're talking tonight a little bit about superstitious Christians. And like the great theologian Michael Scott once said, I'm not superstitious, but I am a little stitious. That went over some of you guys' head, but that is perfectly fine. I had to say it. Um, how many of you guys know what I'm talking about when I say superstition? Well, so I mean, like, I've seen The Office. I know what you're talking about. No, no, no. When I say superstition, you're like, I think I know what that is, right? You think you know what that is? So if you are a, a really superstitious person, you might have some beliefs or some habits or some rules that you don't break. Uh, maybe it's because you think that some of them, if you, if you break that rule, you're going to have bad luck. And some of them, if you do this thing, you're going to have good luck. From who? I don't know. I don't know. I'm just going to have good luck. Well, who gives the good luck? That's not important. I just want good luck. Okay? That's, that's superstition. You might be like, I, I don't think that I'm a superstitious person. I don't think that's me. Well, how about this? Do you ever, like, say, hey, cross your fingers. Like, let's hope. Let, like, here, fingers crossed. I hope it works out. Fingers crossed. That, that's, that's superstition. That's a form of superstition. How about this? You ever have somebody say, like, man, at least, we, at least we haven't gotten a flat tire yet. Hey, knock on wood, right? Like, this isn't wood. This is plastic. You can tell. But you get the idea, hey, knock on wood. And then you're trying to find some piece of wood. To, uh, knock. There's like uh, Clint's guitar, okay? Nah, it's probably too expensive. I can't, repel, I can't replace it if I break it. You get the idea? That, that's superstition. Why do we do that? Oh, good luck. Says who? We don't say that that's God. Like even, even Christians don't believe that, that God gives you good luck if you knock on wood or cross your fingers or, or something along those lines. Somebody, every, anytime that you ever try something for the first time and, uh, and you're really good at it, there was one time, I, I'm not like a gun person. I like guns, but guns are expensive. Have you guys noticed? None of you are allowed to have guns. I don't know why I'm talking to you about this. Maybe your parents have guns and you're like, yeah, I know how much they paid for it. Um, and, and maybe you, you're like, I like to shoot clays or something like that. But listen, I went, to, I went to one of my friend's house when I was in high school, and they had a lot of guns. They had over 200 different guns. And like, they had like a, a closet where they kept the other guns that they haven't even opened or looked at or used in years. And then they got these ones. I'm like, okay, zombie apocalypse happens. I'm going to your house. I'm going to your house. We're going to be fine. We're going to be A-okay. But they, they gave me one of the guns to try, and I, I'd been trying a few different guns, and I'd been shooting at the target, and I hadn't really been hitting anything. And they gave me what I think is one of the most beautiful pistols in the entire world. It was a 1911. It was a Springfield 1911 pistol. Uh, gorgeous gun. Like, if, uh, if any of you, like your grandpa or your great-grandpa, fought in World War II, they probably used this pistol, uh, unless they were on the other side. Um, <laughs> Beautiful, beautiful pistol, okay? They were using something different, okay? Um, they gave me the gun, and I'm like, okay, yeah, I, I shoot all the time, and I aim right at it, and bah, pow. That's what it sounded like. Bullseye, first shot, first shot. And they were like, wow, you really do shoot a lot. And I was like, yeah, just like the last time I shot a 1911. I'd never shot one of those guns before. But they said, hey, beginner's luck, right? Beginner's luck. That's superstition. And really, I'm not here to say, like, oh, you're a sinner if you're superstitious. I think you might be stupid. It might be kind of silly if you're actually superstitious. I'm not trying to be mean. But like in the day, what, what are we actually putting our hope in? It's important for us to think about. Um, some of us, you're like, hey, I do that. I, I don't walk underneath a ladder. I don't walk in front of a black cat. You know, that's just, those are, those are things that I don't do. And maybe you don't actually believe 
that something bad is going to happen if you do one of those things, but you're like, eh, why risk it, right? I've got enough problems. I don't need to invite some kind of like dark magic, witchcraft stuff. Like, I just got too many problems as it is. So you think, hey, this is kind of like a, like a low-risk, high-reward scenario for me. Eh, I don't think this actually does anything, but if it does... It didn't cost me anything. It wasn't very hard. It wasn't difficult. It didn't take any time. And if it gives me good luck, like, who doesn't want good luck, right? If you get it, say, I get it. I think that churches are full of superstitious Christians. I think that churches are full of superstitious Christians who don't really believe in God, who don't actually put their hope and faith and trust in Jesus Christ the way the Bible describes. Some of you guys, I love you to death, but like you come to church in the same way that I cross my fingers for good luck. Like I don't actually believe that it's doing anything. It's kind of a habit. It's kind of like a, yeah, I guess I'll go to church. Might be good for me, right? I've heard people say things like that all the time. I, I'm, I guess I might go to church. Yeah, like, I go to church. I think it's good for me. I might get something good out of it. Hey, couldn't hurt. That's not what church is about. When they come to church, it's not because they want to worship a holy God and get to know him better, but it's because, eh, couldn't hurt. A little church might be good for me. It's good, you know, to have like a, like a community of like-minded people. Yeah, sure. But what about Jesus? Who is Jesus to you? I mean, yeah, yeah. No, no, no. Who is Jesus? If you don't have like a really solid answer for that question, that's just superstition. That's just, honestly, in my opinion, a waste of time. Personally, I think that this guy here in, or at the pool of Bethsaida, I think that he was just superstitious. I think that He's hanging out over here at the pool of Bethsaida because there's this legend that every once in a while, an angel is going to come down and stir up the water. And maybe that was just like bubbles coming up from the spring that fed that pool. We don't know. It was like 30 feet deep. They don't have like, you know, oxygen tanks and masks and scuba gear to go really inspect this thing. So uh, it's an angel. There's this legend. And if I've got to hang out somewhere, I mean, I can't walk. I'm pretty much parked wherever I go. Then... I'm just going to hang out here at the pool. It couldn't hurt, right? What's the worst that could happen? It might be good for me. I think he's just a little bit superstitious. I think if he really believed that the waters could heal him, after 38 years, he would have found some way to get in the water. He would have found some way to get into the water. And so right there, I think it's in verse 5. Let me go back and see it. Yeah, it says that he was there, verse 5. One man was there who had been invalid for 38 years, and when Jesus saw him lying there and knew how long he'd been there already, he says, do you want to be healed? And the first thing that the guy does is he starts making excuses. He says, well, you don't understand, sir. I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. And while I'm going, another steps down into the water before me. Another way to say that is like, hey, why even bother? Why even try, like, I'm never going to make it. It probably doesn't work anyways. One guy, D.A. Carson, was kind of uh, reflecting on this, and he says, listen, when I hear, uh, when I read what the paralyzed man says or the sick man says to Jesus, that just sounds like a grumpy old man who's been asked an annoying question. He's like, don't, don't bother me with these stupid questions, okay? We all know it's phony in the first place. And I think it's interesting because right here, the sick man, the paralyzed man, he's not even contemplating that maybe Jesus is there to heal him. It's not even on his radar. He's thinking, yeah, well, yeah, I'd sure like to be healed, but I mean, the pool, it's so far away, I'm never going to be able to make it. I've heard it's just a legend anyways. Like, he's, he's being pretty pessimistic. It has not even occurred to him that he's standing, or rather, the, the Son of God is standing right in front of him. It's not on his radar. He's, he's got nothing but excuses. He's saying this is the way that it's always going to be. It's always been this way. It's never going to change. I'm never going to be able to walk. I'm never going to be healed. And what we see here is that the sick man, a lot of people, 
what happens is some people settle into their suffering. Some people settle into their suffering. And I think there is an important theology of suffering that we need to have. We need to say, hey, like, why did bad things happen to good people? We need to say, like, hey, when God allows something bad to happen to me, is that like a test? Am I being punished? That's, that's kind of a separate conversation. It's an important one. But what I'm getting at here, I'm not saying that we shouldn't persevere through suffering. I'm not saying that we shouldn't, you know, continue to have faith through suffering. And I think, like, there is a difference between settling in your suffering and saying, like, God, I still trust you, even if it never changes. There's a difference between that and what I think is happening here. He is hopeless. He's given up. Think about it this way. I say settling in to suffering because I think about it like this. When you go to a hotel, maybe you're going to Disney World or you're going over, you know, to another state, out of the country even. When you go into that hotel, how many of you guys, you start painting and redecorating and moving furniture around, maybe even bringing in new furniture. And how many of you guys have ever had like your hotel, you're like, hey, let's get a contractor in here. I need to have this place wired for surround sound. No. Why? Because that would be settling in and you know that you're not there to stay. Hello. You know that this is just temporary. You're going to be there one, two, three nights, maybe a week if it's a long vacation, but that is not your home. It's temporary. You're not settling in. But there are some people, don't miss this, there are some people that they settle into their suffering and say, this is just the way that it's always going to be. God is either not able to heal me or he doesn't want to heal me. And like I said, that's a, there's a very, very big difference there between settling into your suffering and trusting Jesus in the middle of your suffering. Don't get confused there. Maybe you've given up hope tonight over the last few weeks that that your body will ever be what you want it to be, like this man here. They were saying, hey, listen, I'm just never going to have the ability. I'm never going to have the looks. I'm never going to have the, the height or the build that I want. I'm never going to be able to be as fast. You know, there's this, there's this part about me that in, in some ways is disabled, and I don't think I'm going to be able to be what I want to be, and God's never going to be able to overcome that. Maybe you're thinking this sin that I'm dealing with is just always going to dominate my life. This sin or this bad habit, this immaturity even, this is the way that I'm always going to be. I'm never going to be able to pay attention. I'm never going to be able to uh, learn this problem or, or this issue that I need to take care of. Maybe it's a sin issue. Maybe, some of you here tonight, you would never say it out loud, but in your heart of hearts, you think, you believe my family member is just never going to get saved. My friend that I've invited to church a hundred times, they're never going to come. You just settle into that reality. You just settle in. You say, that's the way that it's always going to be. You say, it's hopeless. Why even try? You've settled into your suffering. So Jesus walks up in verse 8. Well, a little bit before that, verse 6 actually. He sees him lying there and he knew that he'd been there a long time. He says, do you want to be healed? And the man just makes excuses. He says, no, this is the way that it's always going to be. This is the way that I am. God doesn't want to heal me. And so Jesus walks up and says, do you actually want to be healed? And I think that's like a two-pronged question. It's like, do you actually want to be healed? Like, do you, do you even want to be healed? It doesn't seem like it. Like, you've not made one attempt at that pool. You've not asked me to help. I, I said hello, and you, you didn't say, oh, I'm so glad that you saw me. Could you help me into that pool? Could you help me? Like, it doesn't seem that you actually want to be healed. And then you could ask that question in another way. Maybe Jesus is asking it another way. He says, do you want to actually be healed? Like, do you want to try something beyond this superstition? Like, this, this is a cute pool and all. Maybe God was really healing some people. I don't know. But, like, this is a wives' sale. This is a legend. This is made up. Like, you're, you're buying something from somebody weird on the Internet. And, like, you know that that's bogus. You know that's not actually going to do what it says it's going to do. Like, it's too good to be true. Do you, do you want to actually be healed? 
Because right in that moment, he's standing right next to God in the flesh. He's standing right next to the creator of the universe. Don't miss this. He's standing right next to the, maybe, the only person on earth who could actually do something about his ailment. And he's just like, do you, do you want to actually be healed? And in verse 8 it says, Jesus said to him, get up, take your bed, and walk. And at once the man was healed, and he took up his bed and walked. Isn't that amazing? That's incredible. I think... I just like how maybe, maybe that's literally the way it happened. Maybe that's the way that John is just describing it. But it seems like Jesus is just like, stop crying. Get up and walk. Like, hey, hey, mm, let me stop you right there. Get up and walk. It seems like he just says, up. I've, I've heard your excuses. Stand up. It says immediately. At once, the man was healed. And I think this is cool because it says immediately or at once, this man can walk. And I think it would have been really amazing to watch because, hey, some of you guys, I don't want you to miss this. I think what we might miss is that it says in that translation, in the original language, it says that he's, he's invalid or he is lame, like he can't walk. Maybe you get the picture. But maybe your brain, your mind just sees this possibility like, hey, this is a guy with two perfectly good legs, but maybe he's paralyzed, right? Like he just can't make his brain communicate with his legs. In all actuality, like the word that's used there, it would sometimes be translated, his legs were withered. Like they had, they had withered away from disuse, from uh, deformity. They were probably very crooked. They probably had almost no muscle mass. As far as we know, some of the bone might not have even been where it was supposed to be. And it says that in an instant, at once, the man stands up and walks. So I, think, I have to imagine that this man's legs are weathered, uh, rather withered and twisted and crooked, and he's lame the way that the Bible is saying he is, that in an instant, tendons and veins and skin and flesh and muscle are just rippling across this guy's legs, and all of a sudden there's muscle where there didn't used to be, and all of a sudden like there, is, there are some legs that are capable of carrying his weight, and he gets up and he walks. I think that would have been incredible to witness. I think it would have been amazing to see. See, this man had suffer, he, he'd settled into his suffering, and maybe some of you guys have too. But you need to understand that Jesus heals the hopeless. I think there are, there are some really cool passages of Scripture where Jesus heals a man or he raises somebody to life. And he says it just like this. He says, listen, because of your faith, you've been healed. You guys know what I'm talking about? You've read passages like that? You guys over there, you know what I'm talking about? You, you're tracking with me? It says, hey, because of your faith, you've been healed. Another, another passage that says, hey, you're your faith has made you well. This guy doesn't seem like he has any faith. This guy seems hopeless. And I hope that some of you guys here tonight, if you, if you just feel beaten down, if you just feel exhausted, if you just feel like, hey, I'm never going to be free of this, I don't, Zach, if I'm being honest, I don't have any hope. I don't think I have very much faith. Jesus heals the hopeless. If you're saying, I can't even lift my hands in worship, I'm just so discouraged, I'm so disappointed with myself, Jesus heals the hopeless. If you're just saying, this is the way that's always going to be. I've been praying for my brother to come back to Jesus. I've been praying for my mom to be healed, but I just don't see any progress. It feels like I've been praying forever and ever and ever. Listen, Jesus heals the hopeless. There are some people that they settle into their suffering, but Jesus heals the hopeless. I don't want us to miss the second part of this chapter. I've got to go quickly. We understand what's happened, uh, and, and most of us would be like, wow, this is amazing. This is incredible. I can't believe it. Glory to God. But here's the thing. Jesus healed this person on the Sabbath. And in that place and time, in that culture, according to Jewish law, it was illegal even to heal somebody on the Sabbath. The Sabbath is a day of rest. Like that part was true, it's in the Bible, but they've taken it to a crazy extreme where you're not even able to heal some people. Some people actually said it was illegal to tie up your donkey, to uh, use the bathroom. I'm not making that up. Uh, it's too much work. 
So they had said, you're not allowed to heal people on the Sabbath. In fact, when this man gets up and starts walking, people see him carrying his mat, because he was laying on a mat, like maybe a mattress, maybe like a summer camp mattress. You know what I'm talking about? Like those ones on the bunk beds that are like this thick. You know what I'm talking about? Like this is not a, not a big mattress. But he's carrying this, and somebody says, hey, it's nice that you're walking and all, but actually they don't even say that. They just said, hey, you're not allowed to carry your mat on the Sabbath. What are you doing, you sinner? Like, they just, they're just pounce on the guy. And he's like, good to see you too, Jim. He said, don't you know you're not allowed to carry your mat on the Sabbath? Who did this? Who healed you? And he goes, I don't remember what he looked like. And they don't see him, and then Jesus comes to talk to him a little bit later. And finally, they figure out, ah, it was Jesus. And some of the religious leaders, the preachers, the, the good Christian people, Christian in air quote, good in air quote, they, they find out that it was Jesus, and they cornered Jesus, and they said, hey, don't you know, you're not supposed to heal people on the Sabbath. And they start tearing into him. And I want us to skip for time's sake to verse 37. And they had this interaction and Jesus just had it with them. He's had it with this man's excuses. He's had it with the, the religious leaders and their complaints. And he says, listen, the father who sent me has himself borne witness about me. And his voice, you've never heard. You've never actually heard from God. Even though you spend every day in church, you've never seen his form, and you do not have his word abiding in you. For you do not believe the one whom he has sent. He's saying, God has sent me. The Father has sent me. I am the Son. And you don't believe me. You don't believe the one that God has sent to you. And you search the scriptures, verse 39, because you think that in them, in the scriptures, you have eternal life. And it is they that bear witness about me. Yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. I do not receive glory from people. But I know that you do not have the love of God within you. Isn't that awful? He says, I know that you don't have the love of God within you. I know that you are dressed like a Christian. I know that you are dressed like a good religious person, but I know for a fact you don't have the love of God in you. I pray that God never says that to you or to me or to anybody here at this church. I pray that God never has to look us in the eye and say, you don't have the love of God in you. But he explains here what their problem is. So the Pharisees, the scribes, the religious leaders, the zealots, the, the Sadducees, all these people, they're a part of the system. Somebody say system. All these people, say it one more time, say system. Hey, you in the back, I love you to death. I love you to death. Over here. Say system. Everybody together. They, they were all a part of this religious system. They'd all been obsessed with going to church, with worshiping this way, with dressing that way, with following this law and this law that's in the Bible, and then these other 500 laws that they'd made up just for fun. Then they were obsessed with, hey, we've got to have the tithes coming in because we've got to pay this guy, and we've got to make sure that we've got enough place for them to live. And listen, we should probably get you guys some bigger clothes. We should get you some bigger outfits. And, you know, you're the priest. You should, you should be looking A-OK. -okay. And the Sadducees, what, what are those? Well, we made them up. They need new clothes. They need jobs. We need to pay them. So you guys need to get more money. They're all a part of the system. And they had built up this system that Jesus comes and he just condemns the snot out of it. And he says, listen, you guys think you're so spiritual. You, there's nothing remotely close to the God of the Bible in you. He says, you do not have the love of God in you. That's not my God, and I know him pretty darn well. They're all part of the system. And some people, they settle for the system. Some people settle into their suffering on this extreme, and then other people, they settle into the system. They settle for the system. And Jesus is saying, you guys are so foolish. I don't know how you missed this. I don't know how you could be so mistaken. He says, you guys are so obsessed with the book about me that you don't recognize the actual me standing here in front of you. 
It's like them saying, like, hey, it says right here that, you know, God doesn't want us to. I am God. Wake up. I'm standing right in front of you. I said, okay, let me get back to you one second. It says here in the book, I wrote the book. This is for next week. Next week we're going to be in John chapter 3. And it's a beautiful passage of scripture. I hope we can do it justice. I hope we have enough time. But there's this thing that blows my mind. There's one, there's at least one good Pharisee named Nicodemus. Nicodemus comes and talks to Jesus, and he has this conversation with him. And this is the part, this is the one verse that makes my jaw drop. Nicodemus starts the conversation with Jesus. He's one of the Pharisees. He's one of the guys saying this stuff to Jesus. He's ultimately one of the guys that puts Jesus on the cross. And Nicodemus says, Jesus. We know that you're from God. So how is it that you do this and how is it? What did you just say? Jesus, I said, I said, Jesus, we know that you're from God. The Pharisees knew that Jesus was from God. They know he's at least a prophet. They know he's at least a messenger from God. They know at least like he's got God's stamp of approval to say whatever he's saying and do whatever he's doing. But they were so focused on protecting the system that they refused the source. That they refused the system that was built to point to Jesus. Some people settle for the system, but the system points to Jesus. It's the whole purpose. It's the whole reason that we have Genesis and Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy and First and Second Kings and First and Second Chronicles and Jeremiah. The whole Bible was pointing to Jesus. And these guys were experts in the whole Bible before they were even 12 years old. All of these Pharisees, Nicodemus and the guys that are Chewing Jesus out right here, all of them, before they were 12 years old, they would have memorized the entire Pentateuch, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Memorized it, word for word. These guys knew the Bible like the back of their hand. They were so involved and focused and, and obsessed with the system that they missed the source. Guys, listen. There are, some, there are some people today that I believe have settled for the system. Do not settle for the system. Systems aren't bad. Systems aren't evil. I'm not here saying, ah, the whole church is this evil, patriarchal, ah, tear it down. Calm down. Read a history book. What I am saying is, don't you dare exchange the source for the system. Don't you dare exchange a good church for a perfect God. Don't you dare exchange, well, I really like to worship over there for a personal relationship with the God of the universe, with intimacy with God. Don't you do it. Because then Jesus would be looking right at you saying, I know you. I've seen your heart and you do not have the love of God in you. You're so focused on protecting this system that you're missing the whole point. That system had made the Pharisees feel safe. It was predictable. They could control it. And so it had become corrupt. And Jesus said, listen, You'll tear this temple down. My father will rebuild it in three days. He says, I'm, I'm not here to abolish the law. I'm here to fulfill it. I'm here to put this back the way that it was supposed to be, the way that it's always been supposed to be. Some of us today, we still settle for the system. You, maybe you saw a couple of years ago, there was this enormous report that came out from a a newspaper agency in Houston, the Houston Chronicle, that came out and cataloged abuse after abuse after abuse that had taken place in churches not so different from this one. And the issue isn't just the abuse. Yes, church should be the safest place in the world. Not just from things like that, but it should be the safest place in the world for you to know that nobody here is talking about you. 
for you to know that like, these are the people who've got your back. These are the people who are going to take care of you. All of that is true, and yet we do have to understand that we're not perfect. The problem wasn't just the abuse. The problem was the lengths that people went to to cover up the abuse, to lie and deceive and manipulate and to twist. And say, listen, if people find out about this, it's going to hurt the gospel. No, your sin hurt the gospel. And for that matter, the gospel hasn't been stopped in 2,000 years. This one sin is not going to destroy it. Hey, if you, do, if you tell people about this, they might not come back to church. The church could be hurt. Not, not the church, your church. And whatever the consequences, hang the consequences. What about your integrity? And you've got to ask yourself, are we protecting Jesus or are we protecting our system? God's built his church, and there's nothing that's going to destroy it. No controversy, no lie, no manipulation. What are you protecting? I've got a couple of questions for you. As we get ready to close tonight, what's your superstition? What is it that you, you don't really put a lot of weight in, but you, you're also living by it every single day. What's your superstition? Is it the things that you do or don't watch? Is it the things that you do or don't listen to? Hear me out. Here's what, I, here's what I'm trying to explain. I'm not encouraging you to watch or listen to movies or television or, or, or music that is sinful and is going to hurt your faith, that is full of things that are dishonoring to God. I'm not, I'm not saying that. Philippians chapter 4 says, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there's anything that's excellent, if there's anything worthy of praise, then think about these things. And so if you're, if you're saying, Zach, there are some things that I listen to that are not God-honoring, that I wouldn't want you to hear, Zach. Uh, there's some things that I wouldn't want my parents to see in my uh, search history or in my Netflix history even. That's not what I'm talking about. Especially if you're younger, if you are middle school, upper high school even, I think you need to talk to your parents about, hey, what are the things that it is okay to watch? What are the things that is not helpful to listen to? But hear me out. I believe that if you've decided that any and all non-Christian music is sinful, I think that's superstition. I think if you've decided, like, hey, I can't watch Anything that's not G-rated, I, th I think that might be superstition. I'm not here to argue with you if the Holy Spirit has truly put a conviction on your heart, but what is it that you're trusting in? What is it that you're leaning on? Why, why do you have a relationship with God? How do you know? Well, because some of my friends, they listen to all kinds of garbage, and, and I don't listen. To, oh, Stop. How do you know that you have a relationship with Jesus? Well, because they went to this movie and I said, I'm not going. Listen, that's, that's good. That might be okay. But if that's how you know that you have a relationship with God, that's superstition. If you're drawing lines in the sand that Jesus didn't even draw, that might be superstition. You're not allowed to carry your mat. Well, you're not allowed to listen to anything that you hear on the radio. Anything? It might be superstition. Maybe it's the things that you do or don't watch or listen to. Maybe it's coming to collective. Maybe collective is your superstition. And here, here's what I mean. Maybe you're like, yeah, I'm a Christian. Yeah, I go to church. How often? I go to collective. Just collective? Yeah, a couple times a week. A couple, a couple times a month, rather. Can I, can I say something? It might make some of you guys mad. Collective is the front door to this church. Yeah. Collective is the front door. You could even say it's the front porch. And, and we, we worship Jesus here. We have community here. We learn so much about God. We grow together as a ministry. We see people get saved. I'm not saying that, I'm not trying to devalue collective. I'm not trying to say that Wednesdays are no good. But maybe if the only expression of your faith happens between 645 and 8 o'clock on a Wednesday night, Maybe that's a little bit more superstition than faith. Yeah. Guys, you need to get involved in a life group. 
You need to get involved on Sunday morning. If the only people that you know how to worship with are the exact same age as you, that's superstition. Yeah. It's not going to be like that in heaven. You're going to hate it in heaven. <laughs> You're going to be ticked off and pouting in the corner while we're praising Jesus because we actually know how to worship with somebody who's 10 years younger or 10 years older than us. It's the front door. It's the porch. It's nothing bad. It's just, if you come over to my house and you, you just hang out on the front porch, you never actually come in, I'm, I'm going to be like, I'm going to go inside. Are you coming? Like, we got to eat dinner at some point. It's the front door. Don't, don't allow superstition to replace the source. Question for, for you guys tonight, and Clint's coming to lead us in a song of response. A question for you guys tonight that I, I just want all of us to ask honestly is the same question that Jesus asked the sick man. Do you actually want to be healed? Do you actually want to be healed? Or even, do you actually want to be healed? Do you want to truly have your sins forgiven? Do you, do you want to actually put that sin issue to rest? Do you actually want to see somebody come to know Jesus? Do you actually want to see physical healing? Do you want to see emotional healing? Because here's the thing, if you're trusting in a, in a 30-foot pool, or you're trusting in your Spotify playlist, or your good behavior... It's never going to work. My experience, whenever I was just trying to be a better Christian, that's how I describe it. I was just like clenching my fists a little tighter, like just try harder. Just, just stop sinning. I, was, I just need to try a little harder. I just need to be more committed. Yeah, you need to be committed. You need to be disciplined. But if you're just more committed to a flimsy superstition, it's not going to get you anywhere. And every time you take a step forward, you're like, I'm trying harder. I'm doing better. I'm making progress. You're human. So you're going to get knocked right back to the starting line over and over and over again unless your identity is rooted in the God who never moves. Unless your heart is anchored in the Jesus that can actually heal Unless your belief is anchored in the, in the relationship, the creator of the universe, that's just superstition. I want to challenge some of you guys tonight to exchange that superstition for the source. I want to challenge some of you guys to stop making excuses. Stop saying, God, well, well I, just, I just can't get to the pool. Well, God, I've just, I've just got so many practices. God, I just, it's really hard. I'm really busy. Well, God, it's just that my friends over there, like, they don't seem like they really love God. And I would, I think I'd be growing in my faith better if, stop making excuses. And don't reject the real thing when he's standing right in front of you. God wants to have a relationship with you tonight. He wants to restore broken hearts. He wants to heal sinful habits. He wants to bring the lost back to him. Amen.